Tonight's topic is on the significance of language in an era when civility and civil discourse seem to have become scarce commodities. It's worth noting that in Jewish tradition, civility does not mean the absence of argument. On the contrary, I believe that the Jewish people, like the American people, are very argumentative. Civil discourse transcends politics, and it is central to our survival as a modern democratic society. Well, tonight we're very fortunate to have two guests with impeccable credentials to help us sort through some of these issues, in particular having to do with the two-way relationship between civil discourse and education. Jeffrey Goldberg is the editor-in-chief of The Atlantic magazine, and to my mind, one of the most remarkable thinkers and writers working today, and I would say he is largely responsible for the revival and sustainability of long-form journalism, not exactly a trivial accomplishment in an age of high technology and fast media that sends messages usually at the speed of light. Moshe Halbertal is one of Israel's greatest contemporary philosophers, a professor both at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and at the New York University, a former member of the Harvard Society of Fellows, known for his co-authorship of the Israel Defense Forces Code of Ethics. And I'll just add one plug, I carry around Moshe's book about Maimonides everywhere I go because every time I open it and reread a page or for that matter even just one sentence I feel like I have learned enough to almost qualify for another few credits toward another degree. <laughs> Moderating and leading this discussion will be Erica Brown, our Erica Brown, the director of the Mayberg Center, associate professor of curriculum and pedagogy here at GW. Erica, as I'm sure you mostly know, is one of the most prolific, provocative, and penetrating thinkers working in Jewish education, and is just one heck of a fantastic faculty colleague. Will you please join me in welcoming Erica, Jeffrey, and Moshe. That's Erica. That's Moshe. And that's Jeffrey. Thank you. All yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Foyer, and thank you all for coming. Um, we're here with uh, these esteemed friends. And um, on this stage is a, a current events expert sitting next to a thought leader on the big questions. Uh, journalism next to philosophy, ancient worlds bump up against up to the minute universe, a universe of politics and interesting aspects of our culture. So Wait, which one is which? <laughs> I'll let you figure that all right, out. All right. um, so I guess my question just to start off with is, what do you each love about your work and what is your greatest challenge as you see it right now? She means you to go first. <laughs> well, she just got off of a plane. He just came from yeah. Jerusalem. That's why you should go first. So, uh, <laughs> Well, I think we, we all deal with words, right? We all make arguments. And I think uh, thinking about the issue of tonight, uh, civil discourse, um, democracy is, is ruled by argument, right? So you, you, win, you win government, you win support by making a case, by convincing that you have the right idea, ideas and you're right person. And always, I think, I think as a philosopher, as, a, as an author, you always are interested uh, with the distinction between argument and manipulation, right? I think the weakness of political discourse, but not only political discourse, argument as a whole, is that very fine distinction between argument and manipulation. Uh, and and uh, in order to maintain 
civic discourse, democratic discourse, intellectual discourse. Uh, um, part of the obligation of any education is to make a student open to an argument and immune from manipulation. Right? Mm. And, uh, and now this is, um, this is not, uh, today's, today's condition of, of political discourse is not, is not a viral attack from the outside. Right? It's, not, it's actually a, a structural weakness or vulnerability of democracy as a whole. Right? It's that very fine line uh, uh, between, uh, and it's you know, in the, the beginning of philosophy where, where Socrates uh, emerges against the sophists, right? This is the issue. How you establish a culture that knows that distinction, that understand mm -hmm. that distinction. Now we are in, a, in an age where, where, where elections are run by, by advertisement companies, where you sell a product, where politics is like selling a product. And you ask yourself, what is left of genuine argument, what is the weight of the word, right? So, uh, I, I mean, if, if I asked uh, the, the business of philosophy in a deep way is, is about that question. Now, what's amazing when you talk to a philosopher is that he didn't actually answer the question at all. <laughs> so I'm actually going to go back to you, Maishi, right. and ask you what you love about your work. <laughs> So I'm going to give you another answer that is not going <laughs> <Okay>. to answer. <laughs> it's going to be a long night. <laughs> well, I mean, the joy of learning, the joy of thinking, the privilege of, of uh, engaging with ideas, right? Uh, this is the heart of what we do. Part of what right. we do. Beautiful. Jeffrey, how about you? His first answer. Just <laughs> right. you love, what do you love about what you do? What's a challenge for you? Um, I love most of what I do, particularly now. Um, you know, it's interesting. I mean, there's a specific, there's a specific reason, specific reason related to my, my publication, my institution. Um, which is that the Atlantic was founded in 1857 um, with two purposes. One was to argue for abolition of slavery, and the, 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 the second uh, was to become the sort of conductor of the American idea, debate around the American idea, illumination of the American idea. Um, and what's interesting about it is that the founders of the Atlantic, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Longfellow, Harriet Beecher Stowe, and so on, uh, in their opening manifesto of the Atlantic, didn't specify what they didn't define the American idea. Sort of, a, they they embedded that as a clue, you know, or as a charge for I think each generation who took on the magazine to figure out what what that is. The Atlantic has always been strongest, as it was in 1857, um, in a, in times of national fracturing, uh, and so we. What do I love right now? I love the fight. I mean, I, I really, I really do. I, you know, it's it's a way of sort of, it's a little bit of self distancing. If you're, if you're, I don't mean the word the way it sounds, just a citizen, right? If you just have to live in this current moment um, without recourse, you, you know, have you have no place to put your, your rage, your energy, your anxiety. It, you know, at least we have in what we're doing a place to put it, which is in the journalism. Uh, and I'm not saying we're necessarily winning any any argument about. The nature and future of America. We're not. We're not necessarily winning in our fight to explain America to itself, which is the fundamental purpose of the institution beyond anything else. Um, but the 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 fight is. Uh, it's a it's a big fight, and it's a, a fight worth having. What was the second part? The bad part. The challenge. Meetings. Too many meetings. <laughs> um, you know the challenge is that we're you know I don't tell you we're we're fighting for we're fighting for values that we thought were fixed. Mm. I mean that's the interesting. 
why is it so interesting a moment if you can distance yourself from the moment and the and the potential tragic qualities of the moment, not just in America, but you know, obviously we see democracy on its back foot. We see a lot of things that we thought were fixed, as I said, um, that aren't fixed. Basic enlightenment ideas about um, the notion that there is such a thing as observable truth, empirical truth, that you can have a set of facts that uh, you could put on a table and everybody around the table agrees upon, and then you argue about the meaning of the facts or where, you know, everybody can have a different view of where they go. We are, we are fighting um, uh, a fight that I don't think is necessarily being won against the kind of um, pre-enlightenment demagoguery. You know, it says that there's nothing, it's, it's you know, it's, it's, um, it's postmodernism and it's pre pre enlightenment at the same time. Nothing, nothing. The words don't mean anything except what I think they mean at the moment I say them. Um, and what's interesting to me is not that there are people who do that, because we've always had people who do that, who will manipulate words to to advance whatever cause, petty, personal, self interested cause. Um, what's interesting is that the um, the immune system, the immune system isn't as strong as I thought it was. That's what's that's what's troubling, and, and figuring out a way to um, have in a genuinely nonpartisan way a, a conversation about uh, uh, the purpose of this country, among other things. That's the frustration. Yeah, that's a big challenge. So, um, why don't you update our audience about what each of you are working on right now that excites you? Jeffrey, do you want to start us off? I mean, I can't talk about individual stories because they're not out yet. Um, oh, well, we want to know. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> stuff coming. Um, I mean, along in, in this general, look, I mean, we also, we're very lucky. Um, we, have, uh, we have owners uh, at The Atlantic who are, who are allowing us to grow it rapidly, which is not the usual course of events in journalism these days. So that's, uh, that's, that's generally speaking, exciting. I mean, what I'm most, exciting about, what I'm most excited about is, um, uh, I'll answer it this way. It's, it's actually more interesting than just a set of stories. I mean, obviously, we're following the Russia investigation pretty carefully, right? <laughs> uh, with, beyond, beyond a set of issues and subjects, um, and we try to hit all of the main subjects, the joy of being in a magazine like The Atlantic is we only have to do the really important things. Um, we're not a newspaper, so we don't have to do everything. Um, but I, I think for me, what's interesting, and I didn't realize this before I, I came into the job, um, for me, what's interesting is trying to take a generation I don't fully understand, which means everybody two years younger than me or more, um, <laughs> a generation I don't fully understand who didn't grow up in the same journalistic climate that I grew up mm -hmm. in with the same received ideas about what a journalist should be, um, and battling against some of the tendencies uh, that I think a lot of people in journalism in their 20s and early 30s have. Um, we're moving into an era of hyper, we've moved into an era of hyperpartisanship and tribalism, and that tribalism has even moved its way into journalism. Um, and so just the opportunity to try to teach uh, a group of journalists much younger than I am at this point, um, that the, the test of, the test of a, whether you're a real journalist is not whether you um, anger your enemies, it's whether you anger your friends. Um, if you can go against the narrow interest of tribe, whatever your tribe happens to be, a dispositional ideological tribe, whatever it is, uh, then, then you're actually performing a service for your readers. Um, and so uh, I find myself being very energized by that struggle. I don't know if we're going to win that struggle. And I don't know if at a certain point my generation of journalists has to sort of step off the stage and say we're actually, it's a back to the future sort of thing where we're moving back into the era of pamphleteering and overt partisanship. Um, but I, I find that interesting to work on as a problem in, in journalism. Mm, wonderful. Moshe, how about you? What are you working on now that's exciting for you that you can share with us? Uh, I'm working on a project that brings two interests of mine together, uh, which is the, the attempt uh, to regulate um, conditions of uncertainty, morally and legally. So uh, if you take war, most difficult questions about war, uh, you, have, you have hard questions, for example, what is a legitimate military target, right? It's a huge issue, right? 
and there is a lot of work done on it. But usually in war, there is another layer of problem, which is you really don't know whether the target is a military target or not. Mm -hmm. So the fog of war creates, puts soldiers and other people in complete conditions of uncertainty. And what is the moral and legal response to conditions of uncertainty? And as I said, I've, I've learned it from my in, engagement with, with issues of military is, ethics in Israel. Now that brings me to another interest of mine, which is you know, Jewish law and Jewish thought, uh, because the, the Mishnah and the Talmud are almost obsessed with uncertainties. Right. What, what do we do when we don't know? Mm -hmm. right. uh, so that's, that's what I'm But you're not certain when you'll be finished with that. Exactly. <laughs> that's a great line to use on your editor. Exactly. <laughs> Who knows when I'll be finished? Who knows when I'll be finished? Who um, right. So Deborah Tannen, who's a professor of linguistics down, down the road at Georgetown, writes that we tend to look through language and not realize how much power language has. And she actually also studied the way that New Yorkers talk. And in that paper, she describes the way Jews, a subset in her research, talk with this brilliant flourish. High involvement, concentric overlapping. High involvement, concentric overlapping as a way that Jews talk to each other, which is, I, I'm so excited by what you have to say that I don't let you finish it. Right. And um, I think both of you. No, you know the expression, Jews don't listen, they, they reload. <laughs> Yeah. I, I have not heard that expression. Uh, now, both Sorry, of you. I told you ten times you didn't hear it. Though, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, that, like... that could be. Um, you know, both of you understand the power of language very intimately and from different angles. Um, because we're here to talk about civil discourse, and I, I suppose it's discontents right now. Is the way we use language different today? <laughs> Well, you know, it's, it's uh, the media, the new media is, is really, um, uh, I would say, language on anorectic level, right? It's not dietary, it's really anorexia. Mm. Um, um, messages are so short. Um, uh, apropos argument, right? Argument needs some space. I always, mm. I always have a fantasy of iconoclastic reform of political speech which first will be no images. We don't want to see your image, right? Mm. Just voice, right? It's almost like God's talking, mm. right? Uh, and the other one is if you have to say something on a subject, you have to talk about it consistently more than five minutes. Right? That's as, fair. An, as an idea. Mm. So let's see if you can actually make an argument rather than a an emotional uh, appeal uh, of sorts, right? A soundbite. Mm. We are not. We so so language is being is being transformed. It's also being transformed, and as Jeffrey said, you know, it's being transformed because it's not clear that it has a reference out there anymore, right? Because the the, the referential nature of language as as something pointing to a reality uh, when when the when the when facts dissolve, when you can change your description of a world in a second, uh, then language has a completely different meaning. And Thucydides says in his, in his work that you know that societies are in very bad condition, almost in a condition of uh, pre-civil war, is when words stop to have weight. Right. So, uh, so we are. Uh, there is a there is a struggle here, of 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 the the relationship between words and 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 the new media of expression. Right. Um, can we abolish Twitter as a as a means of political expression? Right. Are you I was just thinking me? that it would be hysterical <laughs> to see him on Twitter. Right. <laughs> 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 Every tweet would be 7,000 words long. <laughs> I think that would be an excellent exercise, yeah. actually. I think it would be a great parody of right. nothing else. Moshe yeah. Hamilton on Twitter. <laughs> Jeffrey, uh, what do you think about the change that language has experienced? Well, I'm not sure that there was a golden period. Uh, I, think mm -hmm. what, I think sometimes we mistake um, 
the degradation of language for the velocity of, of language. You know, we just have more of it uh, at a quicker, faster than we can process. Um, and therefore, right. um, things that used to, uh, things, things in which civilized people or, 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 or society, whatever you want to call it, would stop, pause, and say, hey, you can't say that. It all goes by. In, a, in such a rush that there's no there's no sanction anymore. I think that's sort of the flip side of what what mm -hmm. Moshe is saying. Um, I mean, this is a very interesting question about the the mainstream media, you know, of which I'm a proud member. Um, uh, you know, you're not supposed to be a proud member of it. You're supposed to, you know, it's supposed to be Yom Kippur. You with the, you know, on on. Uh, about the mainstream media, but uh, for all of our for all of the faults of the mainstream media, which is that we limited participation in democratic discourse. You know, we we put barriers up to the to the to the flattening of of, of speech. Um, the mainstream media, to this to some degree, still today, but but less than than ever, uh, provided the necessary filtration to keep out the crap. Right? Um, I mean, it turns out that not everybody's opinion is worth hearing. Um, and certainly the way that these opinions are expressed are not worth hearing. And, and you degrade and you dissolve and you decompose through this, through the, the over-democratization of, of speech. And I think, I mean, there's so many different problems to disaggregate, but I think that, that one of the things that we don't focus on enough is, is simple velocity. Um, it comes at us so fast. We invent technologies, technologies before we know how to use them, uh, obviously. And, and we might look back, I hope, 20 years from now, we might look back at the Twitter period of American political history or, or world political history and say, what was that about? That was quite odd. Um, and, but I'm glad we pulled back from that brink. Uh, I, I don't believe that necessarily is the case. I don't know what the trajectory is. Um, but I, I think that um, there is a... Uh, that gatekeeping, which has been in disrepute, uh, partially, I mean, it's partially been disrepute because the companies that made the most money out of lowering the gates had a vested financial interest in, in making you feel that lowering the gates, ending the filtration process, was in the best interest of democracy. They, they, they ascribe to it lofty, virtuous goals um, and meaning. Uh, I think there's a more and more of a realization now, uh, and I hope we're turning a corner on this, that there is um, a utility uh, to expertise. There's a utility to filtration, that, that, um, that gatekeeping has some role to play um, in the way we conduct our, our civic business. So it's interesting, because I was going to ask later a question about technology, but I'll just throw it out now. Uh, because both of you are dealing, I imagine, in different ways with the impact of social media. And Jeffrey, you just said we, we're turning a corner. So are we turning a corner? Can you describe that a little bit? Well, the corner that we're turning, and you know, you could thank this current political moment, um, the, the corner we're turning is that, the, this is the irony, the mainstream media has never been stronger in terms of overall readership. It's been stronger, obviously, in the advertising market, but that has to do with a set of other mm -hmm. issues. Um, but engagement, at the same time that there's a portion of the population that seems to be immune to the, to the sort of issue that we were just talking about, observable empirical fact, you know, um, there, there is also a larger and larger portion that seems to be energized by the, the fracturing of the moment and turning to traditional sources of information and, and analysis. So there's that. Um, and look, I, I spend a lot of time in Silicon Valley now, and I know that there's a, there's a reaction. Maybe not among the people who are getting the richest off social media platforms, but there is a reaction. I mean, I, I think, and, and, to, and uh, I think there are people who uh, are early, are early innovators at Twitter and other places who realize that they've unleashed a monster. You know, um, and, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fight, and I don't know which way the fight is going to go, but um, I, I definitely feel like there is a, there's a renewed appreciation for, uh, let's say, slower discourse, slower relatively speaking, mm -hmm. slower discourse, deeper discourse. Um, I mean, here, here's the thing. It, it, ten years ago, when I joined The Atlantic from another great magazine, The New Yorker. Ten years ago, we assumed that The Atlantic in print would be dead by now, right? It was just that was the, the trajectory. We've never had more subscribers in print than we have right now. You know, we added 70,000 last year. Um, so, yes, that's right, <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> and everybody who clap gets a free subscription. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I, I don't know where. I mean, I, I don't want to. I don't want to sound overly negative. I don't actually talking about uncertainty. I don't know. Where, where this is going, but there's still a demand for the kind of thing. And I'm, again, not saying that anything is perfect in the mainstream media. We make terrible mistakes all day long. But I think that there's the possibility of redemption here. It's good to know. Um, Maishi, we have this concept in Pirkei Avod and Ethics of the Fathers of a machloket l'shem shamayim, an argument for the sake of heaven, right. um, which I, I believe that the sages understood what that meant. Right. Um, and their belief was that if, if you argue in the name of heaven, that kind of argument endures, but if it's not in the name of heaven, right. it doesn't endure. So I'm, I'm curious as to what you feel is an argument for the sake of heaven today. What's worth having an argument about and what's not worth having an argument about? So uh, my understanding of this, this statement is the following. Arguments that are made uh, for for reasons of search for power, sectorial argu arguments, right? They're not going to last because those interests are passing, right? So um, um, let's take the case of you know the Israeli budget argument about how distributed distribute budget. If you if you are a sector, you say, well, I don't have a principle here. Right? There is a budget, and there is a fight between us how much of that budget we can take for our tribe. Uh, now, tribes are passing phenomenons. I mean, there are they're, they're, they're different configurations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So those sort of arguments that are motivated by, by partial power-seeking arguments are not going to endure. The principled arguments will resonate for generations. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think um, um, the, the Mishnah says this is the distinction between uh, the debate between Korach and, and Moshe, right, and between Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel. So You might want to explain that. For well, I mean, I, 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 arguments that, that really are about power-seeking, pure arguments of interest, they, they might be very important for those who engage in it, but because they're local and ungeneralizable in principle, they don't have any endurance, right? But, but serious arguments about equality, justice, uh, or in, in, in law or other things, they will endure because they're independent of the, the changes of in, interests and sectors and, 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 and tribes, et cetera, et cetera. This is, this is my... They transcend that. Yeah, they transcend it. So in politics, many times you have to seek, you have to say, well, where is the principled argument here? Is there an argument, right? And the, always the sign for it is, can you generalize it, right? So. Uh, when, can you generalize it across all citizens? Or is it just a defense of a certain interest group? Right? Mm. And, um, and if it is, I mean, it's not going to endure in the sense that there is nothing that transcends the moment in this clay. Right? I think that's the... That's the essence of yeah, how you understand yeah. it. Jeffrey, any thoughts on... You what know, today would constitute an argument for the sake of heaven, and what do you say? Well, very few of the arguments we're having today are about the, for the sake of heaven. I mean, everybody's Korach, nobody's Moshe, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's funny because if you're a politician, you know, Korach is the, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the Torah, I mean, is, is the symbol, he symbolizes sort of petty political maneuvering, right? Mm -hmm. And so you, it's interesting because if you actually frame this on Capitol Hill, said, look, you can be Korach or you can be Moses. Most people would say, I, I'll choose Moses, but no, nobody models that behavior anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's interesting because, and maybe it's because there's a diminution in quality of our political leadership, not just in this country, but everywhere. And I'm not being partisan about that. I've been talking about the people who are drawn in to one of the interesting aspects of Israel mm -hmm. is that most sectors, uh, most sectors have draw the most important sectors draw excellent people. You cannot say the same about the political sphere. Yeah, um, the uh, generally, not right. specifically. There, are some of you know, some of our best friends are in the Knesset, so we have to be careful. <laughs> um, but um, but you know, the 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 thing is 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 that um, 
in, in politics, there are no role models for this right now, which is why the number of issues that you could argue about for the sake of heaven have increased, because no one's actually arguing. You could sort of put a whole, there's a whole basket of them. I mean, I think just to go back to this, this um, the question of, you know, what are you working on question, it's, I, 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 I want to spend a lot of time thinking, and I want other people to spend a lot of time thinking about Madisonian democracy, right? I, I mean, the acute challenges that the current age technological age posed to Madisonian democracy, the growth of the imperial presidency, all of these issues. You know, the, we need to be having this conversation about how far we've moved away from the vision of the founders um, and how, their understanding of human nature and their understanding of the dangers of direct democracy. Uh, these are arguments worth having. You could find yourself on any side of this and, and, and there are interesting and complicated and justifiable arguments to be made around this central issue of how the U.S. should be governed. Um, but, you know, we don't have those arguments at all. Right. We don't, and, and, you know, and I actually think they're interesting and, and, you know, maybe they don't sell as many whatever you're selling, but um, there's a way to make them interesting and a way to, to make people grip by the importance of having that argument right now. And that is, that is the argument that endures. The way you know it endures is because because the it. founders were arguing right. about it, right. and we're still, we still need to be talking about them. I think actually one, one issue that comes from this in general is, and in Israel, but not only in Israel, is, is the, the negative selection process to politics, right? Those who can endure it, there is something wrong with them, right? <laughs> And this is a bad thing for politics because you don't want to, you want good people yeah. to be there. It's the most noble calling, right? Uh, and in Israel, clearly it's a luxury a country cannot afford not to have the best politics. Mm -hmm. Now you have to, this is a question for the media as well. Uh, the scrutiny, the viciousness, the, um, uh, the way in which someone can be destroyed very easily, uh, that makes p good people say, I, I really don't want to be there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, w there should be a self-examination, systemic self-examination uh, about what happens to a society that creates channels and structures that engage in a process of what I would call negative selection process into leadership. That's not true about everyone, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a, that's a, a bad sign for the, for, the, for the society as a whole and engages the media as well. And, and, the, uh, and not only the media and the nature of, of, of debate and the nature of winning a point, or I would say, when uh, in politics we're in a, in a moment in which there is no rivalry, a rival is an enemy, and you're in the business not of arguing but in destroying. Mm -hmm. Now, many good people really don't want to be there. And when there are serious pressures and politics involves high stakes, that's a luxury you cannot afford. So this is another issue we have to think about it when we, when we talk about this. Yeah, I actually, I, um, yeah. I actually want to quote something from your um, from your recent uh, your recent book, The Beginning of Politics, um, and we have we have books of both of you uh, for sale afterwards, and there'll be a, a book signing for those who want to join. Um, you know, you've been involved, Marcia, in the creation of the ethics code for the Israel Defense Forces, really translating notions of power into actual behaviors right. on on the on the battlefield. And then in your latest book, The Beginning of Politics, which is your study of politics through the book of Samuel, you write, politics is seen as an overpowering human necessity that can never fully escape a potentially self-defeating betrayal at its core. And then later you write, finding themselves venerated by those around them, the supremely powerful almost inevitably begin to worship themselves. So what do you see as the relationship, because you were writing about an ancient book with obvious right. modern resonances, the relationship between power and civility? Well, I think, I think one, one general problem in politics, that's true whenever there is power involved, et cetera, is a, a certain 
endemic reversal of means and ends in politics, right? For, for the citizens, power is means. For the ruler, it might become an end, right? You ask yourself, what is the main goal of a president in his first term, right? It's staying there, <laughs> yeah. right? Now that's fine and fair, et cetera, et cetera. You don't want it to be dominated. Now when, when, when power then becomes an end rather than a mean, you begin to instrumentalize all your environment, right? There is a moment in the book of Samuel, right, where, where Saul realizes that he has a rival, very charismatic, powerful rival, David. And he's seeking to destroy him. And he learns that his daughter, Michal, loves David. By the way, that's the only time in the Bible where it's stated that a woman One loves a man. man yeah. And here's a father. And it, the, the, the text says, Vaitava davar be'enav. He likes it. And you think, yeah, he likes that his daughter is in love with a great guy. No, no, he has another plan, right? And he says, and he comes to David and says, you want to marry into the family? You have to bring some, you know, some dowry, right? And bring me 100 foreskins of the Philistines. Well, he had the idea that the Philistines wouldn't like that thing. <laughs> I so. think that's fair. Yeah, so, and he thought they're going to kill him, right? The Te'iboyat plished him. Now you ask yourself, he's a father, right? What will happen if the plan works? His daughter will be destroyed. Basically, it's beginning to... But you've to got a lot of foreskins. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 just saying. I have exactly. a step for this. Exactly. It all evens out. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> now, you ask yourself, uh, he's using her. He's using her, right? Mm -hmm. That's, you know, love, you, you would say, the, the, the most basic definition of love relationship, that it's a non-instrumental relationship, mm -hmm. right? Now, what happens when you begin to instrumentalize everybody around in order to stay there? I think what happens is a complete corrosion of relationship of trust, right? Because your environment will begin to mm -hmm. instrumentalize you. Mm -hmm. And then you become isolated. And then you become insecure and paranoid. And the combination <laughs> of power and insecurity is lethal, mm -hmm. right? You don't want leaders that are insecure, <laughs> right? It's a problem. I understand. And, and, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, and if you see, I mean, the, the genius of the book of Samuel is the, the way in which Saul becomes, you know, mm. he feels there is a conspiracy around him, right? All the time, right? And then the, the massacre, that is unleashed by his isolation, right? Now, these are, these are, these are I think, endemic problems to, to political structures that, that, that might be self-defeating almost, right? But leaders and people around have to overcome those tendencies. And it has to do with um, um, a deep desire or plan to instrumentalize your environment in order to stay there. At that moment, you become very isolated and insecure. So this is an issue that, that I think it's, you know, when power emerges, it's there, right? It's there even today. Right? This, this moment of Saul and, and Michal is heartbreaking, mm. right? Um, yes, that's, that's, a, that's one lesson, um, the relationship. Now, there is another, there is another lesson that, that has to do with military, uh, military ethics. You know, um, there is this David killing of Uriah in, 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 in that powerful chapter. And he does it by way of of a chain of causes, right? Uh, the, at the end, the Ammonites kill Uriah, not him. He can, he can, and, and one thing in political crime is that uh, the crime can be distributed across many agents, right? Power, if you ask yourself, what is power? Power, the, pow the real powerful can actually distance themselves from the acts of violence they unleash mm -hmm. by creating a long chain of causes, right? Now, uh, uh, and then David comes and says, what drew me to the book of Samuel 
is this line when David says to, to Yoav after they have killed uh, Uriah through the Ammonites, and he says to him, Kazevich azot ochal acherev. Thus, in, uh, the, 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 the sword devours this way and that way, as if the sword is an autonomous predator, mm. right? Nobody holds the sword. Now, the one weakness in military action, but also in political action, it's such a complicated division of labor between different actors. So actors might think that actually there is no agent. Nobody did it. It but happened. It's what we call the war machine. Mm. Right? And uh, the relationship between uh, politics and disassociation, right? Because of collective action, right? And that's always a, always a struggle, right? You want to say it's not that nobody is responsible here. Everybody is responsible here, right? Everybody who contributed a little bit to that. But then no change. one's accountable. Ultimately. You know, now, for example, we talk about technology and technological changes. Now a pilot gets a target. He has coordinates. He doesn't know what the target is all about, right? Mm. There, there is such a complex division. And he has to trust his command that they actually took care of all those issues that are important for him as a person. So you have, to, you have to ask yourself, what does it mean ethical agency in a highly technologicalized structure mm -hmm. with such very fine-tuned division of labor among agents as, as a question for, for politics and, and military ethics? Yeah. No, that's a question we're probably not going to answer tonight, right. <laughs> but a deeply important one. Um, you know, Jeffrey, I know that you, you wrote Prisoners, um, a Muslim and a Jew across the Middle East divide a long time ago. Um, a Los Angeles Times critic wrote this about your book. The realization of the humanity of the other is at the heart of New Yorker magazine correspondent Jeffrey Goldberg's sharply observed and beautifully written memoir. So I'm wondering how you turn that, the human, that expression, the humanity of the other, that lends onto journalism and education today. What does it take to realize the humanity of the other in today's climate? Because we can analyze the problem, but of course, there are a lot of us in despair right now and asking ourselves, well, what would it take to humanize the conversation? Because at heart, we believe not only that that's an important value, a universal value, but that, it's a, that compassion and empathy are at the core of what it means to be Jewish. That's a lot of questions in that. Um, no, it's interesting. I was thinking about what Moshe said about uh, journalism and the, and the role that media can play in, um, and what, I mean, what some people call, we'll start here, uh, a lot of people call this context collapse, right? Uh, which is, I, I can find something now, because everybody says so much in social media, I can find something that you've said you can decouple it from mm. the context, decouple it from the moment, decouple right. it from your, um, and turn that into an attack ad, literally or figuratively a, against right. you. Right. Um, and we're all participants in this. And I, I want to say, not, not to absolve the media of this problem, uh, because we're the uh, key conveyor belt of, of this, but, um, you know, as commercial enterprises, the, the, uh, it, we rely on the public to eat what we're, what we're serving. Mm. Um, and obviously, we've mel we're all melding into one thing, the advertising, uh, the, 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 the turning of politics into advertising um, ha and, and the creation of attack ads um, conveyed through the media and then eaten by the public. All of this is one, um, one huge machine that is designed to erase complication. Because that's what we're talking about. I, I mean, and and by the way, uh, speaking up for, I, I don't like the expression long form journalism because that just means journalism with more words than other kinds of journalism, <laughs> right? Um, but 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 there's a realization on the part of a lot of journalists that you simply can't say things in a complicated way with 200 words, 300 words, a tweet, um, and 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 part of part of our role and 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 part of uh, I mean, the, the, the salvation of society will be the recognition of human complexity. Um, you, you talk about that in, the, in, this, uh, in this book I wrote about Palestinians. Um, 
you, you, you know, I haven't really thought about this in a long time, and, and my, my views have hardened a little bit about the conflict in the intervening years. Um, nevertheless, um, I think that you are not going to understand your adversary, understand your enemy, unless you do a couple of things. Avoid axiomatically assuming the worst about them, and this obviously has huge application in politics. Mm -hmm. Avoid ascribing the worst motive possible without evidence to make that uh, to make that judgment, um, and also to to not to not understand the thing about the other that you understand about yourself, which is that you contain multitudes, and that and that there is complexity to your story, and that there are contradictions, and that nothing is is neat and sanded off. Going back to this idea of context collapse, um, if everyone, if everyone is simply the sum total of the worst thing they've said or done, mm -hmm. um, or the worst thing they said or done that's been captured in the panopticon of social media, uh, then for one thing, politics will continue to draw only the worst people, the most, the ones with the the biggest voids who need to fill those voids with public acclaim or the power, instrumentalized power. Um, you, you know, and that's the biggest. Going back to this theme you talked about earlier, what, what's the, what, what is the, what are the great challenges? The, the challenge in journalism, just as in politics, uh, is to make things more complicated, um, to recognize the complication of the human condition. This is not, by the way, and I don't want anybody to think I wrote a book that's in, in, in good part about people in Hamas and, and people in Islamic Jihad. And, and um, at a certain point, you do recognize that some people are sort of um, satanically simple and, and that they are, and, and, and looking for the good is, is a fruitless in, endeavor. Uh, but maybe those people are the exception that proves a general rule. And certainly when we're talking about the way, going back to Israeli politics or American politics, for instance, the way we talk about each other, um, we talk about each other as if we really don't like each other. And that is the, ultimately the recipe for the dissolution of the, the ties that, that bind both of these countries, countries we're talking about, um, you know, are built around a um, certain set of ideas, certain set of voluntary associations, and uh, the, the danger of, of of losing the ability to project yourself into the other is um, is what's going to be the end of us. Thank you. Sorry, that was very depressing. <laughs> it was, it was, but uh, but we'll kind of, we'll keep going. We'll we'll get to the we'll get to the hope. Um, I actually want to welcome my uh, my uh, my graduate class in um, diversity and development here tonight. I want to give them a shout out, and, and this question is for you. Uh, between trigger words, microaggression, and intersectionality, campuses feel less linguistically safe. Um, has diversity in some way compromised liberty right now? Because you have, ironically, a lot of professors feel afraid of what they're going to say and feel that in certain ways students now have more linguistic power than they do. So I'm just interested, Moshe, you, you were just at NYU last semester, as you are annually. You're at Hebrew University. Yeah. Yeah, what are you, what are you thinking about Well, first this? of all, these are two very different institutions and culture of speech, right? Mm. In Israel, I mean, this will be a very rough, um, um, unfair generalization, but Israeli students, Nobody read and everybody talks, and American students, everybody read but nobody talks, <laughs> right? Uh, I, I mean, about the papers and materials. So there is a, an argumentative quality of the Israeli class that is a little bit different and less, uh, less reverence to teachers or culture of, of, of discussion. I mean, I, I must say, I, I, at the institution I teach, I don't feel that that sense of paralysis of uh, of being unable to to express the my thinking etc i i think actually there is uh, there is a healthy sensitivity that that is is welcomed 
healthy sensitivity is welcome. I had one experience when I, I, I had a, a lecture I gave at the University of Minnesota that was disturbed by, by protesters because I was an Israeli professor. Um, and I, I must say, I, I, didn't, I didn't mind, I, I mind the disturbance, but what I dislike is the moral intimidation of this sort of action on their environment, because I saw other students just being paralyzed by that mm. moral intimidation. That's what worries me, not so much the end of speech, but the moral intimidation is kind of a... Well, they're linked. You know, the end of speech is linked to that. I mean, yeah. if you, if well, you yes. realize that there's no, um, there's no percentage in speaking your mind on a college campus, what is that campus? Yeah, and then, you know, it's interesting because one student, one student wrote to me an email, very beautifully, an email afterwards. You know, I said, I'm going to stay. You know, I'm going to say what I want to say. Actually, it wasn't about Israel. It was about war and asymmetrical warfare and other things. And one student wrote me the letter and uh, uh, an email and thanking me that I stayed, gave my lecture, etc. And I said, you know, if everybody would have to be dragged out of that hall and just you and me would stay there, it was, would be worthwhile coming to Minnesota, right? Dai la olam ani ve'ata. It's enough to. So uh, I, I, I think. I think the issue is really about not so much, it's other voices feeling um, shot and intimidated. That's what, well, it's connected to, to the capacity of speech. In the, in the institutions I teach, I feel, I feel this culture actually didn't constrain speech, but made it more aware and sensitive in a good way. That, that's where, that's so my you're experience. seeing it as a, as a positive manifestation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in the law, I mean, then there are the, there are the perversions of that, but where I teach, I didn't, I don't feel that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Jeffrey, you want to jump in on that? The, um, you know, on the one hand, there are probably people who ought to watch what they say a little bit more, and understand the sensitivities of people from marginalized communities. I don't want to go into, I don't want to start invoking lingo here, but but ought to be aware of what it's like to, to come from a marginalized community and walk onto a very wealthy, very privileged, very connected campus and, and, and experience that. On the other hand, I, 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 you know, I probably align closer with um, Robert Zimmer's view, the president of the University of Chicago, who tells students on their first day, you know, here is your trigger warning for the next four years. <laughs> you're going to hear things you don't like. You can leave whenever you want. But you're going to hear things you don't like that are going to offend you and challenge your assumptions, and, and you're going to read books with offensive imagery, and, and, and you're just going to have to deal with it. I think that's the better way to do it. I don't, I don't like it when university presidents um, slip too far down the pathway of, um, of equating um, sensitivity with suppression of uh, Huckleberry Finn. You know, I, I mean, you. you the, the, there's a, there's a problem in that some of the manifestations of this issue have been so absurd that um, you, you lose sight of the fact that there are things that universities should do um, for minority students, for, uh, for otherwise marginalized students, to make them feel part of the great project. Um, one of those things, of course, is to do like Zimmer does and others do, and say, look, this is the purpose of the university. Um, the purpose of the university is not to reinforce your tribal ties. The purpose of the university is to get you to challenge uh, every received wisdom, every, every sort of, every sort of uh, sacred cow belief you have when, when, when you got here. Um, I just see this, I mean, I have a, a lot of millennials who work for me, and, and I, um, I try to create an atmosphere uh, at my magazine that says, look, you're going to have to work next to people you don't agree with but we can do this within a big tent framework. Obviously, big tent connotes that there's some things that are outside the tent. You have flaps on a tent. Um, but uh, I do worry about these things going too far. I do worry about um, isolated examples of absurdity being, uh, being made to stand in for the whole as well. I also do worry, by the way, since you're asking me for worries, I, I do worry. <laughs> I do worry that there is a movement afoot on some campuses um, 
well-meaning movement to regulate speech on behalf of those marginalized people without understanding that it's always marginalized people who will be, who will be the victims of those speech, of the speech guidelines in time. If you're a marginalized person and there are regulations being put uh, in place, um, you will be suffering unduly under those regulations soon enough, and so that's another worry. Mm. Well, it's interesting, a few years ago, I drove to Johns Hopkins campus, and I was very interested in the work of um, P.M. Forney, who is a Dante scholar, and he wrote a book called Choose Civility, and he's the co-founder of the Civility Project at Hopkins University, because he felt that he was teaching his students something that was very important to him. And he thought that through literature, you learn to be a better human being. And then he realized that wasn't at all true for what he thought he was doing in the classroom. So he has these 25 principles of civility. And I, I wanted to, um, to share the ninth one with you. It's respect even a subtle no. Respect even a subtle no. And I guess we're watching the implications of some of this right now in the Me Too movement. What do you think this, how do you think that contributes to an environment of civility, respecting the subtle no? Moshe, you might want to speak about this in relation to military ethics or? I'm not sure I, I follow you. I mean, are you, are you asking if that's a negative or positive I mean, I, value? I, 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 do you feel that that's a principle of civility is to respect the subtle no? Because you know, if you look at the Jewish tradition of debate, it's very, very robust. In fact, we have a Yiddish expression, no one dies from a question. In other words, let's, let's go at it. Let's, let's interrogate that assumption. You can't have a community where there's vigorous argument without underlying basic human respect and, and dignity and respect for the other and that person's principles. Um, I think that's one of the problems on these campuses that everything is, feels so fragile because people genuinely don't feel respected or included and are sometimes made to feel that way by people with specific, what I would call anti-democratic or anti-intellectual inquiry uh, kind of agendas. Um, so I think there's some sort of balance that can be struck. Uh, once, you, once you feel as if you're being heard, perhaps, maybe I'm being Pollyannish here, but once you, once you feel that you're actually being included in the conversation, um, you'll have more tolerance for challenges to your viewpoints. I don't know. Marcy? So I, I think two things come to mind. One is, uh, and here I, I want to go back to the issue of political discourse and relationship to civility. Um, the, one, the one thing where, where democracies or arguments begin to crumble, I mean, let's take the case of the murder of Rabin, right? This was a, a horrible moment in Israeli life, the murder of a prime minister. And when you look at what led to it, it was an incitement. It was something deeper, I think. And it had to do with a group of people who said, Rabin is not mistaken, he's, he's a sinner. He's not, he's not the, the shift from mistake to sin, or the shift from saying, you really don't have a legitimacy of issuing um, a, a policy on this subject matter. You're not a legitimate sovereign. At that moment, the bullet will come. Right. So uh, that's, that's one issue that is, uh, you want an, a nonviolent transfer of power. That's, that's a nonviolent form of adjudicating difference. This is democracy, right? When there is high stake politics, it's very hard. When temperature is very, is very, is boiling, right? Uh, the, maintaining that feature of democracy and nonviolent adjudication of difference is very difficult. Sometimes I look at the country of Israel, I said, wow, there is so much temperature here in the debate. Would we succeed actually in adjudicating in a nonviolent? I look at my own family, right? We have disagreement, political disagreements, and we don't want to talk about them in, let's say, in the Seder, because that 
the Seder will become Pharaoh's revenge. I mean, <laughs> it's a, so, so the issue is uh, moving from the language of mistake to a language of sin. One, one issue or illegitimacy, when you say, I don't know, the, uh, when you begin to question, you say, well, our, the, 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 the current president is illegitimate, he stole, he stole the election, etc. All, all this stuff or, or different things in which you, you undermine the very structure of our capacity to adjudicate in an unviolent fashion differences. But there is another thing which is, I think in, in politics, but also not only in politics, there are certain sacred things you're not going to do in order to gain some more advantage. Let's take the case, uh, apropos military ethics, there's a, a case of an Israeli soldier Azaria, Elor Azaria, right, who, who shot a, um, um, an incapacitated terrorist, right? Now, there is a, we know that the public, portions of the public, and I think in every place, are so angry, and they have good reasons to be angry, that they think that terrorists should not come alive from engagement. We don't know, we don't want to ask how but we don't want them to come alive, right? They should be dead. Now, this is, not, you want, this is not a way you want soldiers to operate because soldiers are there to eliminate a threat. They're not executioners, right? They're there to eliminate a threat. When the threat is not there, the justification for action mm -hmm. ends. Now, as a politician, you don't want to score points on that matter, right? Though you might say, well, I might, I might win some points in the public. And I think, I think political discourse is measured by the question, are there some issues we're not going to use in order to score points, so, right? We're not going to say in the day of elections, the other side is coming by buses, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know, uh, they're voting, that, that other group, the minorities, uh, we, we know. Uh, and I think you know that countries deteriorate when some sacred realm is it's bridged, is bridged, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think different political cultures, different political moments, um, they're measured, leadership is measured by the capacity to maintain that sacred space. There are some moves we are not going to do. We're not going to say, uh, we're, we're not going to inflame the rage of the public against terror. When, when soldiers are being educated not to be executioners but to be protectors of threats, right? This is a, a real issue, right? And it's very easy to inflame those sentiments mm -hmm. in order to make political points. I think that's a big issue in political discourse. You always have What's to ask What's the sacred it. boundary? What is the sacred boundary? What is a move you're not going to do? Are there? Mm. Are there? Right? Are there, though you might win points, right? You might win some support. You might gain some advantage. And I think leadership is measured by that in politics, but not only in politics, but, right. Mm. Jeffrey, do you it want to It turns out that we're not, what we've learned in this country is that we're not actually governed by laws, we're governed by norms. Mm. The norms of presidential behavior, the norms of civil discourse. Uh, we have to universally agree on these norms and understand the value of restraint, that only through restraint will there be a continued democratic experiment. Um, and, you know, uh, I mean, we're assiduously avoiding using direct examples here, but I can have a few. Um, uh, Moshe uh, mentioned uh, the Sterling example from, from Israel in the last election. Um, the prime minister violated a norm. I mean, he violated, he won, in part because he violated that norm. He, 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 he saw the opportunity and he took it, but he debased the country and he debased the, the, the norms of civilized, restrained political discourse. Um, 
I don't even have to, I, I don't even have to, if I, we can make a list all night here of the things that have happened in this country um, around this, this, these basic subjects. It turns out that not everyone was in, in agreement about what you don't do and what you don't say. Um, and I come back to this idea of an immune system. You know, we, we thought that, that, that the, 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 the immune system was strong. And it turns out that it's not strong. We have to participate, all of us, in the immune system. By the way, I'm not making only a partisan point. Obviously, I'm directing this at, at uh, some people a few blocks away. Um, but uh, there's no perfection on the other side. Um, and there's no, there's no doubt in my mind that all politicians will be subject to the, the temptations to take a path that, that might lead to temporal victory um, but ultimately corrode the nature of the civilization that we've built together over a couple of hundred years. Right. That's the, that what's, what's unique about this moment is that people say things and do things that they used to be forbidden by custom to do. And that when you violated those customs and norms, you were censured by the, 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 the body politic or, 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 or by your own constituents. And so that's where we are, and that's why, it's, uh, that's why it feels a little bit sour these days. So really, you're not talking about politeness, right? It's not about civility, well, it's, it's politeness, it's... right? And it's, not, it's really about those, the, the boundaries of, of what, it, what moves you don't make, right? What moves, you know, there was a very interesting, this come from another, completely another different realm. Uh, foreign media says that Israel attacked the uh, Syrian nuclear reactor, right? Foreign media. Uh, and that was a major important thing. I mean, there was a nuclear reactor being built by, by etc. Olmert was then the prime minister. It's very interesting. And the, the military people, the military command said to Olmert, don't declare that Israel has done it. Because you want the other side to have some space of deniability so it wouldn't have to react. Now, for a politician to give up credit for such a performance is a huge thing, mm. right? And there he was. I mean, Olmert has his own problems, right? You have a gift for understatement. <laughs> <laughs> Now, there he was, and he didn't take credit, right? He said, OK, I'll, I'm not. You can imagine him making a, you know, bringing some general. He'd have shot up in the polls had he done it. Absolutely. And he understood this will risk lives, right? I mean, this is a noble moment, mm. right? So uh, here you say, that's leadership. Uh, and and I think I, I, I think there you you test you test discourse or or political moments in this in this uh, the capacity to restrain a, a, in that respect legitimately political desire which is to win points right I thought it was remarkable again you say you're right this is an understatement you know on the ended up in prison, unfortunately. Uh, but here he was, right? Yeah, and I, you know, it's interesting you speak about the noble moment. And I guess this is my last question for the evening before you're whisked away to sign books. Um, it, it seems when I think about the, the work that both of you do, that you're trying to create a more idealized world by writing about ways in which we failed to achieve it. And I guess, I guess when you, know, you have a, the national anthem of Israel is the Hatikva, the hope, this enduring question as you're, as you're dealing with, with the collapse of, of, of some aspects of civility as both of you have referenced, what gives you hope today? What inspires you today and keeps you going? You talked about the fight, Jeffrey, and, but what's, what's What's the silver lining? What's the hope that you, that you feel that can change this? Because you've got to feel that, because that's what you're, you wake up every morning to do. Well, it's not the journalist's job of the journalist to provide hope. It's the job of a journalist to provide facts and analysis. 
I mean, I, I don't, I'm but not. But what gives you hope, not in terms of what your job is, you're, you as a person struggling with these, these aspects of humanity. Let me talk about these two countries that we seem to be talking about more than other countries. Um, I mean, it's the 70th anniversary of Israel's founding. Um, the whole thing is so improbable that uh, uh, hope is embedded in, in hope is embedded in the in the story of of rebirth of the Jewish people in their ancestral homeland, right? I mean, it, it, the whole at every moment, at every turn. I've been I've been worried lately and thinking a lot about what might be the coming war um, in Israel on the Eastern Front, the Northern Front. Um, I always step back and, and say, I mean, this is one of the great gifts of being Jewish, right? You can always say, oh, well, it was worse so-and-so. There's, something, there's always something that's worse, right? Um, uh, and so, so my hope is that, um, is, is, uh, is that Israel survived worse and that Israel muddles through and that, that the whole thing is so ridiculous and absurd that a, overstating this for dramatic purposes, but that um, a dead people or a people on their knees come back to life and somehow restore themselves in their, in their ancestral homeland is so, um, is so improbable that, that um, the optimism is embedded in that uh, uh, set of improbabilities. On the US front, um, you know, we're an old democracy already. Um, I don't know. I actually don't know. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I don't know if we can survive um, our inventions. Sometimes we barely survive the invention of the atom of, of nuclear weapons. I don't know if we can survive our, our inventions and technology. Um, I hope that we catch up. I hope that that the pace of uh, maturation can match the pace of invention. Um, and I don't know if democracy can survive these, these inventions. But on the other hand, I take hope from the idea that this, is, this has been a going concern for more than 200 years. Um, it's faced worse. Obviously, it dissolved itself at one point, um, but it came back together imperfectly. Um, I, also, I also have hope, by the way, just a small point, but I, I, I have hope in the, in, um, the, in the modulated expectations that I've developed as I get older. Um, the no, no, no. It, it's true. You know, like people say, well, America's a failure for this. America's a failure for that. First of all, the, the experiment never ends. Democracy never becomes full. Like you never reach a moment next Tuesday at four o'clock where we say, well, American democracy seems to be perfect right now. <laughs> um, but the story of America is, is the gradual expansion of rights to groups that didn't have rights. The story of America is um, uh, is continu continually overcoming. Um, challenge is, is facing it, um, and so in the imperfection, but in the in the in the in the, but in the imperfection and in the self criticism and in the gradual movement toward the expansion of rights is is some hope. But I, I don't I don't expect a perfect country. It's a it's a human endeavor, um, and the same thing with Israel. I mean, Israel suffers this even even more in a kind of way, even in the American Jewish community, by the way, where there's the you know there's this 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 fantasy vision of what Israel has to be perfect or else. I'm, I'm shedding it. I'm leaving it behind. Um, and, and I'm as critical as the next guy um, about the various policies of the various Israeli governments that I don't like. I served in the, in the army at a, at a time where I was carrying out policies, involved in carrying out policies that I loathed. Um, uh, but, but since that point, I've sort of modulated my understanding of what's possible. Uh, and, uh, and, and when you... <laughs> I don't mean to sound like this, but when you lower expectations to some degree, um, it, it, you know, it's a, it, you, begin to, you begin to appreciate what exists. I'll give one final example from here. In November of, of 2016, we thought that was it for American institutions. A lot of people thought, well, American institutions are not going to survive this. American institutions have survived. Norms are a problem. It's the cartilage, not the bone. But the bones, uh, you know, the bones are are are, are doing okay, and and so uh, there there's there's some of the worst things that people said would happen have not happened. That's a very Jewish kind of view. Um, <laughs> you know, it's not as bad as it could be. Um, 
And I think that's true for both countries, and I think that's true for the state of democracy around the world. It, we're, we're not in a state of collapse. We're in a state of, uh, of, of, of decomposition that requires vigilance that will lead to some self-corrections. Okay. Thank you, Moshi. Well, hope. What so, so gives you hope? I would say three things. First of all, uh, it's not so much a matter of hope, but a refusal to surrender. Mm. Right. And uh, you know, looking at our parents' generation, I mean, they would, we would be ashamed before them if we surrender. You know, for what they have gone mm. through. Right. Uh, so that's one thing, the refusal to surrender. It's, it's not so much hope, but the almost humiliation of giving up and giving up now. I mean, for whatever things you believe in. Uh, the other thing is that, that, uh, that surrender is, is self-fulfilling, right? If you, if you declare defeat, you actually make it happen. But the third thing, and here we come to the first question you asked, what is it that we like about what we do, uh, that gives me hope is the students. You know, I, I meet young, young Israelis in that case that are exceptional. You know, exceptional in what they are, in what they do, in what they care about. And uh, we failed to a certain degree in giving them a, a, a place that maybe some of its major issues will be resolved, Our, my generation is. But there is something about them that, that makes you very hopeful, you know, their, their vitality, their, their care, their ideas, you know. I, I, my friends tell me all the time that I'm uh, kind of the most experienced politician in the country because I tend to run the country in my head all the time. <laughs> and, and when I meet someone else who does it, we even form a government. <laughs> so, but I, I see, you know, I see... Uh, Do you have coalition crises I, in your head? <laughs> all the time. All the time. Uh, so, uh, but, but I, I, I see the... I, I see the... I see a lot of resources, very powerful. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's one wonderful benefit of at least the, the work I do, which is teaching, mm -hmm. right? Where you, see, you, meet, you, meet, you meet young people who, who you say, wow, they, they, can carry, they can carry this and they can carry it. Again, that's another thing we come. You want them not to shy away from political politics. Right. I was going to add something to what, based on, it just, it just struck me that one, one of the, the tasks of people in their 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s and so on right now, maybe the crucial task is to create conditions in society through the imposition of certain values and restraints and so on, so that people who are in their teens and their 20s now find decide that they want to go into leadership, that they, that, that, that they find this a worthwhile path and not a, right. a destructive path, uh, and that only a fool would go into this, or a right. masochist, right. Uh, or an egomaniac. Uh, and maybe that's, the, maybe that's the, the crucial task right now, is to, is, to, is to try to reset some of the conditions that have disintegrated or deteriorated, so that the best of the generation that Moshe is talking about actually choose that pathway rather than some other pathway that's safer and more anonymous but doesn't actually fulfill uh, the, the needs of the civilization. Okay, so, so it sounds like... Uh, that's easy. The investment yeah. of... Uh, Get to it tomorrow. The investment in it. It's the homework for hope. Um, <laughs> the homework good. for hope and, uh, and that's the work that uh, both of you are doing and we're grateful for it. Um, and that's the work that all of us have to do in keeping the conversation going. So I want to thank both Thanks. of you, and I want to thank all of you for coming. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.